Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. Um, and those of you who are watching on Facebook, welcome again to you. And of course, those watching back on YouTube, welcome to you as well. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris and I am the editor of Bright Green. So Bright Green is an online publication which focuses on uh, progressive analysis of um, social movements, of uh, the UK's green parties, of the labour movement and of culture. And as part of a new series of events, the Bright Green Debates, we're bringing together a series of people from across the left, um, people who are involved in trade unions, in the media, in campaigns, who are MPs, uh, parliamentarians of all sorts, and so on. Um, and this is episode three of those debates. So I've got a few bits and pieces of housekeeping before I introduce our panel. Um, the first thing just to say is for those of you who are joining us on Zoom, please do keep yourself muted. Um, it just means that we don't get any background noise and your face won't randomly appear um, uh, being streamed live across the internet um, uh, if you don't want it to. Um, there's also a chance if you've got your camera on that might happen. So if you don't want to accidentally be streamed to Facebook, uh, maybe turn your camera off. Um, the next little bit of housekeeping is just to say for those of you who are watching via Facebook, please do share the link to this video. Uh, that means that we get more people watching it, more people hearing from our incredible panelists and more people hearing from Bright Green. And if you're watching back on YouTube as well, please share the link, like the video, tell us what you think underneath in the comments and make sure you subscribe. Finally, before I introduce our panel, um, I just wanted to say that you can tweet along on the hashtag Bright Green Debates and keep the conversation going on there. Um, I think that's all I need to say as uh, by way of introduction. Um, so now I am absolutely honoured and privileged to introduce our fantastic panel for this evening. Um, we've got some really uh, meaty subjects to be getting through and we've got the perfect people to be discussing them. Um, so first up this evening, um, and maybe um, you can give a little wave when I introduce you for those watching on Zoom. Uh, so first up this evening, we have Claire Hanna, um, who is the SDLP MP for Belfast South. We also have joining us this evening, Rosie Sexton, um, who is a Green Party councillor in Solihull. We have Josiah Mortimer, who is the co-editor of Left Foot Forward and a long-standing supporter and writer of For Bright Green. We have Afroz Fatima Zaidi, who is the Canaries uh, weekend editor. We have Chris Saltmarsh, who is a co-founder of Labour for a Green New Deal. And finally, we have Pascal Robinson, um, who, um, for full disclosure, is my colleague at We Own It uh, in my day job. Um, Pascal is We Own It's campaigns officer. Um, so I think that is all I need to say by way of introduction to the event and to our panel. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to jump straight into our first question. And it's a question that I'm sure lots of you will have been following over the last week. Um, with uh, what's been going on in the world and what's been going on in the news. Um, and I believe it's still being debated right now in Parliament at second reading. Um, so this is really hot off the press as to what's going on right now. Um, and I'm going to come to a froze first on this one. Um, the question is, well, I mean, it's a relatively straightforward question, but it's a massive challenge. Uh, the question is, how do we defeat the policing bill that is currently going through Parliament? Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. Hi, good evening. Uh, the question, so uh, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because how do we defeat a bill as people and not as MPs, right? Um, the obvious answer would be, of course, lobbying your MPs, uh, writing to them, making sure that you are making your position on it known so that they are representing your views um, when they're voting in Parliament. Uh, the fact that Labour is not abstaining is good news. Um, however, I think probably what we, what I would also like to address, and maybe what we also need to be thinking about is what the bill represents and how we defeat that. And what it represents effectively is a slide into authoritarianism. Um, pretty clearly, I think. I think it's not really controversial to be saying that at this stage because of what's in the bill and what if it effectively does is uh criminalize protests um so it's weird even that it is actually being debated in parliament because these you know this government um decided to appoint 
a free speech champion in universities because they supposedly care so much about free speech and about the expression of free speech and the fact that free speech isn't suppressed and the liberal value of it, um, you know, the value of free speech in a liberal society and so on. So it's really strange now that they are with one side of their mouth saying free speech champions and on the other side, um, putting forward this bill to actually criminalize protest. And really the, the reason that they are doing it is uh, because, you know, it's like I said, this um, slide into authoritarianism, which we need to be very wary of. And we need to um, just, yeah, sort of uh, be conscious of the fact that that is what this bill represents. Uh, I think on a wider note, it's generally tackling, because unfortunately the, the vast majority of the public still in the UK uh, consumes you know, broadsheets, uh, tabloids, um, corporate media, t you know, uh, TV, uh, news on the TV and so on, and that's how they get their news. So I think it's also about communicating to those people as much as possible, people who you know don't consume independent media, um, reaching out to them and kind of making sure that there is an alternative narrative in their lives as well. So yeah, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to bring Claire in next. So Claire, um, I know that you today or yesterday tabled and uh, were part of a group of MPs tabling amendment to stop uh, the policing bill. Um, so you're kind of uh, working firsthand uh, in Parliament trying to defeat the bill. Um, so I wondered what your reflections are on um, the bill itself, the parliamentary process so far and um, how we defeat it. Yeah, I think I think it's worth saying that it did kind of um, and and uh, with you know appropriate apologies to those for whom it didn't sneak up who've been watching um, the development of it with alarm. But I, I know obviously I'm a Northern Irish MP and and with respect to you know English votes, English laws, and and the fact that policing is entirely devolved, we haven't engaged very deeply in it except a few weeks ago when it was published. Going. Have you looked at this? It's wild, and it's and it's everything you 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 said it was in terms of you know massively uh, overreaching and yes, criminalizing uh, protest and allowing those very um, you know broad definitions that would that would cover almost uh, every area of 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 kind of freedom of expression and 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 gathering and and, and so on that people would seek to use. It, it, it's worth saying while you know obviously it, it's overwhelming to to see every day uh, such a majority that the Conservatives have and and I suppose the normal you know lobbying of your MP and so on there's there aren't close votes at the moment it's worth saying that the way to oppose it is exactly how it's been done in the last three or four days now um quite clearly if the um appalling policing uh in Clapham on 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 Saturday night hadn't happened um, there probably would be be very little mobilisation uh, against the second reading in, in terms of the of, of, of the debate today. But I suppose um, that was a very visual representation of how um, you know protests can be policed very very poorly and and what's at uh, and and what's at stake. And I suppose just in terms of the surge of emails that I would have received in, in, in my inbox over the last um, seventy two hours, you know that has created a mobilisation that was needed on, on this bill and it certainly will have alerted um, MPs who, who maybe were kind of following a whip or, 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 or who haven't particularly engaged in this area of, 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 of uh, policy. So it's that and I suppose explaining um, explaining the principle at stake, but in practical terms, because because obviously the the rebuttal from from the government, you know, they'll hide it in. Oh well, you know, this is just about more serious penalties for the for the worst offenders and so on, and they're kind of hiding. Um, you know, hiding the, 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 the scope and the reach of this bill um, in, in some kind of popular um, criminal justice uh, mechanisms. But I suppose exactly the type of mobilisation that that um, 
that that the MPs who've been leading on it and the civil society groups have managed in, in the last couple of days, explaining it to people in tangible terms about what it would mean um, for, for, for their lives. And genuinely, I mean, as I say, it doesn't affect Northern Ireland other than, you know, I suppose principle and tone. Um, it doesn't affect here practically. And I've had at least a couple of hundreds of items of correspondence in the last uh, in the last few days. So I, I would imagine that can be replicated uh, in, in, in GB. So that's how you do. Um, that's how you do a mobilisation against it. But in, in terms of um, the scale of the majority and the votes, it's just the recent amendment has just um, fallen very substantially. I mean, it didn't it, it there, there there hasn't been anything approaching a substantial um, conservative uh, rebellion at this stage. Um, so it, it is just going to be um, maybe picking off um, those conservatives who, who, who we know are um, who, who we know are maybe susceptible uh, to a fair argument on, on, on civil liberties. Thanks, Claire. Um, so I'm going to bring in Pascal next. So um, obviously one of the things that has been kind of mentioned already in this conversation, but also more widely, is the the potential ramifications this bill has in regards to the right to protest and in regards to um, civil society's um, ability to, uh, you know, to hold governments to account to to make change and so on. Uh, so what 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 kind of do you think are the, 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 the key threats to campaign groups and to uh, civil society around this and um, I guess building on what we've already heard? What do you think um, can be done by those groups to um, to fight back against the bill and to defeat it? Thanks, Chris, and thanks for having me. Um, I suppose, yeah, the bill is absolutely wild. As Claire said, the bill is quite frankly disgusting in terms of the way it will uh, prevent us from, as you say, protesting. Um, and it's designed to scare people. So now uh, they're saying anyone, uh, any protest that is disruptive or aggravating uh, could be stopped, that ministers will have the chance to, to prevent um, protests going ahead. And of course, this is really worrying because the whole point of a protest is to be somewhat disruptive. Um, that that's, that's one of our few powers. Um, I think that the way that we, the way that we fight this bill is is through protests and through, um, as Zara said on uh, Zara Hassan on a TWT call yesterday, collective dissidents, much in the same way Sisters Uncut have managed to reframe this bill in a matter of days, as um, as as the police crackdown bill and have through their amazing brave actions over the weekend uh, managed to start a national fight back. Uh, I think that we need to continue to wherever we can, wherever we feel safe, be on the streets, doing what we can to pressure MPs to 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 fight this. Um, I, I saw a No, no Borders Manchester uh, letter to MPs today calling for the delay of the second reading and I wasn't sure of the actual mechanics of how that would work. I don't know if other people are, are more clued up on how that would work but um, yeah, I, I, I think that we need to continue to just keep raising the voice and groups have been doing a, um, a decent job of of raising that. I've seen kind of the change to orgs, the green pieces of the world coming out now. So I think we just need to keep hammering it. And, and if it does pass to um, wherever people can safely um, exercise our rights all the same. Thank you so much, Pascal. Um, so I'm going to bring in Josiah next. But before I do, I just wanted a reminder for everyone watching on Facebook, please do share the video. Uh, we'll get more people watching, more people hearing from our incredible panellists and more people discussing this vitally important issue. And of course, wherever you're watching this, you can tweet along on the hashtag Bright Green Debates. Um, so Josiah, over to you next. Um, so um, I guess obviously your background in kind of media, what role do you think that the media can play in, um, I guess, exposing uh, what this bill really means about informing people about it and helping um, to defeat it? Yeah, thanks. I mean, you know, we're doing everything we, we can at Left Forward to, to flag the kind of resistance that I, I hope will, will be sort of going on over the next few days. Um, I think you know, where are the, one of the key questions is where are all the sort of libertarian conservatives that you hear so much about? Um, you know, I, I think one of the sort of efforts of the movement in the next 
in the coming sort of days and, and couple of weeks is to really try and root out you know those conservatives who say they care about civil liberties um, and actually get them to speak out on this. Um, I thought it was a really grim irony actually today when um, the government presented its defence review you know wrapped up in all this grandiose language around defending democracy across the world you know on the same day as th this policing bill has its second reading which you know is almost certainly going to clamp down on, on our rights to protest um, I think there's there's maybe a legal angle to this although it shouldn't be the sort of priority you know how, how does this fit in with our right to protest which it is still enshrined in in, in UK law and, and in the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so I think that's something that definitely needs to be looked at, but I, I definitely agree with Pascal and, and others that, you know, we need to do everything we can to, to stand up to this using all forms of protest. I mean, yeah, there's parts of this bill which are, are just downright bizarre, you know, noise limits on protests, who monitors that, you know, where is that kind of, where is that tracked from? Um, I think it's also important actually to recognise that there are already quite serious restrictions on our right to protest, obviously, particularly at, at the moment during uh, during the pandemic. I mean, over the weekend, we saw, you know, organisers threatened with £10,000 fines for organising outdoor an outdoor visual, you know, mourning, uh, you know, someone from the community. Um, so I think we also have to recognise the, the existing limits that there are on, on free speech and, and fight back against those as well. I mean, many of us probably on this call will have been at the student protests in 2011 and, and have been kettled for, you know, what's allowed to be an unlimited amount of time. And of course, there's been many other protests which have where that's happened as well. So I think this should be hopefully part of a starting a debate, a conversation about, you know, what, what the ideal looks like and actually trying to reclaim some of those rights that have been, you know, lost over the, the past decade or so. Thanks, uh, Josiah. So I'm going to bring in Rosie next. So what's your take on this? How do we defeat this bill? Thanks, Chris. So I think there's been some really interesting and, and great points raised already. And in terms of how we practically defeat this in Parliament, uh, there are people here who are much better positioned to comment on that. You know, I know Claire's going to have a much better handle on the mechanics of how we go about doing that than I will. Um, <clears throat> I think my perspective on this is um, from an angle of how has the government managed to persuade people to give up so many of their legal rights. And this isn't the first example of them doing that. Um, I read a book recently by the secret barrister called Fake Law. And in that, uh, it, it explains very clearly about many of the changes to the criminal justice system and changes to legal aid. Um, and he talks through how has the government managed to persuade people to, to give up so many of these rights and that right to representation. And in a nutshell, it's because they've managed to convince them that this is something that other people benefit from. This is something that will never affect you. Um, it'll affect other people who are um, people we don't like, people who are badly behaved, people who do things that might harm you. Those are the people we're targeting. We're not targeting you. And that's how the government has persuaded people to go along with this in so many cases. Um, how we change that? I mean, there was a lot of talk that Labour were originally going to abstain on this bill. And for those of you like myself who've been watching um, if in despair almost as, as we see public opinion exit stage right pursued by Keir Starmer, um, suddenly for them to turn around and say, no, we're, going, we're actually going to oppose this. Well, me, why did that happen? And I think a lot of it was about the context um, because suddenly we had an event that took place that changed the, the tone of public opinion. Um, and this wasn't being presented as, you know, a bunch of unruly hippies who are protesting against something that, you know, it, this was people who could be imagined to be family members or daughters, you know, the, the people who, the, the conservatives think of as their voters, suddenly they could see, you know, or, or, or Labour think of as their voters, suddenly they could see this as something that could potentially affect them. And I think that's what made the difference. So I think what we need to do is we need to get out there and convince people that this is something that affects them and to show them in practical terms how that works and how 
you know, how this is something that, that should matter to them, you know, what rights that they're, they're giving up here. Um, I think the point Josiah made about um, well, where are all these libertarian conservatives who care about freedom of speech, I think that's really important, you know. Um, I represent a ward that votes conservative in the general election. So for me, the question I always ask myself is, how do I explain this on the doorstep? You know, how's that conversation going to go if I'm talking to somebody who um, who votes conservative? Is maybe, uh, I mean, some of these are, are people who I agree with on so many things, individual issues, um, but they see the world in a different way. And for me, part of the challenge is how do I get into that mindset? And how do I understand where they're coming from and why they're voting the way they are? And how can I have that conversation to try and bring them along? Um, and I think that's something that we need to, to get into the habit of doing. Um, and that's a, a bigger question around social media and filter bubbles and all sorts of things, but I've already gone on too long. So I will stop there. Thanks so much, Rosie. Um, so finally, I'm going to come to you, Chris. Um, so obviously your background is in sort of grassroots organising inside and outside the Labour Party. So um, similarly to what I put to Pascal, um, what do you think uh, the implications of this bill is going to be for, um, for yeah, grassroots campaigning, organising um, and activism? And how do you think we can defeat it? Yeah, thanks, Chris. And <clears throat> thanks for having me here as well. Um, what are the implications? I mean, I think it's, it's transparent that this, you know, that this bill can be put to Parliament is indicative of the weakness of the opposition and the strength of the Tories majority, which by necessity makes it a very difficult task to defeat this bill um, here um, now. You know, we can speak about parliamentary manoeuvres and resisting it in the streets. In all likelihood, I think this bill will go through. And as I said, I think that indicts the situation we're in. To take the slightly longer view, I entirely agree with Josiah that this is an issue of freedom of speech. And I think on the left, as progressives, as socialists, we need to be much fiercer about defending freedom of speech as a principle in the abstract, but also in practice. When things like this um, are thrown at us from the right, from this government, who themselves perversely have made freedom of speech a pet issue. So we need to be defending freedom of speech on university campuses, in the media, but also um, on the streets. And the, the, the last point that I wanted to make that I think is so, so important that we've not touched on yet is that this bill is treats Gypsy, Roma and Traveller people absolutely disgracefully. Liberty, the human rights organisation, described the bill as a direct attack on the way of life for many people in these communities. Uh, and so I think, you know, as the left, as progressive movements, um, we need to be sure that just as much as we're criticizing um, this bill on the basis of its restrictions of our ability to protest and exercise our democratic, democratic right to protest, we need to be equally, if not more, vociferous in our opposition to it on the basis that it is further penalizing, it is literally criminalizing the existence of one of the most marginalized group of people um, in this country. We need to do a far better job of building solidarity with GRT communities. Um, and that involves sorting out our own house as well. You know, I speak from the perspective of being a grassroots Labour activist, and I know that there are too many Labour MPs, there are too many Labour councillors who have an outright despicable attitude um, to Gypsy, Roma and Traveller people in their community and have for far too long colluded um, with a criminalization and the marginalization of that community. So that solidarity needs to be absolutely forefront um, as well as the you know, really fundamentalist defense of freedom of speech and our democratic rights too. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, so I'm gonna pause there and see um, if any of our panel want to come back in on anything that's been said so far. Um, and while I wait to see uh, if you want to and you're trying to find the raise hand button, uh, I'll just say one last time for those of you who are watching on Facebook, uh, please do um, share this video and uh, make sure that we get more people watching it, more people hearing from our incredible panelists. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, give us a like, Give us a share, give us a subscribe, and I'm going to bring in Pascal, uh, who wants to come back in on something on this. Yeah, I just really wanted to really echo everything Chris said. This is a really important time to build solidarity, and this bill um, also 
really will lead to more policing of already over police communities. That means black, brown and racialized communities. Um, I read today from the Community Action on Prison Expansion that this bill could offer tax breaks to um, charities building prison academies, meaning that like prisons for kids could be uh, seen as worthy of tax breaks. So it's things like this that we really need to, yeah, it's, it's just one more way that this bill was absolutely shocking and we need to really build solidarity. Um, just in the same way, uh, the similar bills to this were got, well, there was a movement against them in the 80s as well. Um, when people came together, I believe the free, the free party ravers and other campaigners as well. Um, Brilliant. Thanks, Pascal. Uh, I'll pause one last time to see if any of our panel want to come back in on this. Um, and if I don't see anyone, I will move us on to our next. I can't see anyone indicating they want to jump in. Um, so we're going to move on to our second question now. Um, so our second question. Um, uh, so one thing to just say is that all these questions have been submitted by um, our audience. Um, so thank you to those who have submitted questions um, and have shaped this discussion. Um, but our second question is, um, I guess, more broadly around um, the COVID pandemic and the response to the pandemic. Uh, and in a specific area of policy, um, the question is, is now the time to introduce a universal basic income? Um, off the back of the economic fallout we've seen from the pandemic. Um, and I'm going to bring in Rosie on this one first. Thanks, Chris. Um, and this is something that I'm really passionate about, actually. And uh, in answer to your question, no, this isn't the right time. The right time was 18 months ago. Um, but the second best time is now. Um, and I think, um, I mean, one of the things that I've been seeing locally is that um, people's ability to protect themselves from COVID, to follow the rules, to um, help stop the spread, a lot of that directly relates to their ability to, to put food on the table, to pay their bills, to not have to worry about um, taking time off work because they're not sure whether their employer is going to um, uh, discipline them because of it, or because, or whether they're not going to be able to um, to pay their rent. Um, and this is something that I raised uh, a year ago with um, with some of our council officers, specifically in relation to our social care workforce, because a lot of our social care workforce are still on zero hours contract. And I brought this up and I said, well, look, if you're asking people to stay at home if they have a cough, you know, or if someone in their household has a cough, if you're a social care worker who's on a zero hours contract, who doesn't get paid if you don't go to work, your flatmate has a bit of a cough, which is probably nothing. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay at home or are you going to go in? Um, and it's a horrendously unfair position to put people in where the lives of those people that they're caring for depends on whether or not they can afford to to take time off work um, in many cases unpaid um, so i raised this issue and i was told actually there's nothing we can do because these contracts are outsourced it's not up to the council so we can't interfere with those employment conditions um, and in the end, we managed, um, Solihull set up a, um, a hardship fund for social care workers so that there was a bit more of a safety net. Um, although, as I pointed out, this isn't a substitute for appropriate paying conditions. Um, but that's just an example. I mean, that's, that's one example out of many. Um, what we've seen is that the government's done, um, has supported some people in some positions and some industries but it's been selective in how it's done that and there are a lot of people who've fallen through the gaps you know people who are newly self-employed uh, people who maybe earn part of their income from self-employment and a, a, a part-time job um, people in lots of different situations and um, we've seen so, through the the work done by excluded uk um, to raise awareness of this um, at some of the problems that this isn't good enough 
because the people who are falling through the net, they're also the people who are not able to necessarily follow the rules. The people who are, in the words of some of our council officers, people are looking to bend the rules. And I, what I keep going back with is, well, how can you blame them? Some of these people have had no support for a year. Um, and all of a sudden they're put in a position where they're, they're unable to feed their family. You know, what are you going to do? Of course, they're going to bend the rules. So for me, it's the government's responsibility to make sure that there are, people aren't falling through the net. And from my perspective, the easiest, the most effective, the most um, efficient way of doing that is with a universal basic income. It's been something that um, people have been talking about the benefits of this for a long time now. And I think this is absolutely the right time. I mean, as I said, the right time was, was at the start of this, not 12 months in, but, uh, but now would be a very good time to do that. Thanks, Rosie. Um, so over to you, Josiah, would now be, as Rosie put it, a very good time to introduce a universal basic income. Yeah, and I think actually the idea has probably become a, a bit less radical than it than it maybe used to seem. I think one of the interesting things of the past year, you know, is, has been just how normalised the idea is of giving people support, because we've been in a situation where almost everyone has needed some kind of support over the past yeah, I think it's really interesting looking at the, you know, what's happened in, in the US. They've had three rounds of massive, you know, stimulus checks going out to households, covering, I think, nearly every household, something like six trillion dollars. Um, and then I think you look at the situation that we've got. I mean, even that isn't, you know, a universal basic income, but they've, they've pumped absolutely trillions into supporting people during the pandemic. Um, and of course, now, now Biden has too. Um, and I don't see why we can't do something more ambitious here you know we we absolutely need a, a sort of british rescue plan um as as rosie you know said that the gaps in our safety net are absolutely appalling you know family members and friends and you know i'm sure we've all heard stories of people having to rely on 92 pounds a week you know when they've been ill during this pandemic and having to rely on statutory sick pay um i think it's also worth looking at you know what what the problems are that we're trying to solve because i think although universal basic in income would solve many of these i think we also need to address some really other major problems um you know the collapsing bargaining power over the past few decades with you know trade union membership halving i think a universal basic in income would give people a much stronger negotiating hand with employers you know being able to say no i'm not going to take your zero hours contract on minimum wage you know i i do have a choice I think that's also something that needs to be addressed, addressed through, you know, industrial power, high rents, clamping down on um, exploitative landlords and, you know, skyrocketing rents and, and you know, the absolute scandal that is how low wages are in the UK. So I think, you know, we need to be looking at this kind of holistically and asking what, what, what are the problems that we're trying to solve through this policy? Um, and, and, you know, there are clearly many, many areas that, that Britain is really failing on, um, you know, even compared to um, other countries like the US. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so I'm going to bring Chris in next. So um, I think both of our initial panellists have ex sort of uh, set out quite clearly the gaps in the social safety net and um, have made a case for the universal basic income as part of that. Um, do you think that the universal basic income is a solution to those gaps in the social safety net? Yeah, look, I think the universal basic income is, um, it's a good idea. And I think, for, you know, it's something I would like to see at some point. The question is, is now the time to introduce a UBI? Um, actually, I don't think it is. I think we need to think about sequencing here. So, you know, the previous two responses did a good job of, um, of thinking about, so what are the problems that it's trying to solve? You know, insecurity and precarity, dependence on work, um, poverty, structural unemployment, we're about to see a huge unemployment crisis, I think. Um, and, you know, it, it, uh, as Josiah said, it may well contribute to workers' leverage, um, and, and give give the population more of a financial freedom. However, I think we do need to be really clear on what some of the potentially adverse effects of introducing a UBI um, might be. Um, I think there is a risk that a UBI becomes functionally a, subsid a subsidy um, for rentiers, so landlords, uh, or for the private sector. 
Um, so we need to do the work of um, demonetizing, decommodifying, um, and demarketizing large chunks of our economy which provide basic needs. Because I think there's a real risk that if you introduce a universal basic income, so you know everyone has however much it is um, a month, let's say a grand, hypothetically, in your pocket, um, more a month, and everyone has that. Um, what is to stop private rented landlords? hiking their rents 500 pounds a month. Across the market, they go up 500 pounds. And what you're essentially seeing is a transfer of cash from the government to private landlords via the population. Um, so, and you know, you could see the same with food, you could see the same with utilities, you know, you could see the same with education that is paid for. I think, you know, one of the examples I often go to with this phenomenon is when George Osborne introduced um, the masters, the postgraduate loan, it was 10,000 pound loan, um, a few years ago, what you saw in the years immediately after that, after, you know, ev everyone had a guaranteed access to this £10,000, master's kind of courses in the UK on average went from being around 5 or 6k to 7k to 8k to 9k. And now um, you're hard pressed to find a master's course that isn't in the top end of that 10k bracket. Why is that? That's because the market knows that people have access to the funds um, to pay for it. And with things like, with, like rent, like utilities, these aren't services uh, or provisions that people can opt out of. And so um, the kind of the market mechanisms around demand um, wouldn't, um, you know, wouldn't work quite so well. So what we need to do is with these, um, with these basic services, we need to, you know, bring them into public ownership. So we need to make sure that housing is a basic right, we need to end um, private landlords, uh, massively expand council housing or um, direct um, home ownership by occupiers, we need to make sure that food is a guaranteed basic right, we need a national food service um, to do that provision, we need to bring um, transport, water, energy, all mail, all of that into public ownership uh, and provided for really free, for, for really cheap or for free. And we need to make sure we have a national education service that makes education free and accessible from cradle to grave. And we need a mass program of green jobs to make sure that anyone who wants to work can work um, while also contributing to a Green New Deal and solving the climate crisis. So as I say, that I think there is a role for the for a universal basic income um, to contribute to solving those problems. I've been very correctly um, outlined. They could do huge deals for uh, a, a huge deal for bargaining power uh, and financial freedom, as has been said. But I don't think uh, it's a sufficient response to this kind of the crises that have been exacerbated by neoliberalism, that process of marketizing the economy, of commodifying the economy to simply respond um, with a monetary solution. We need to be reconfiguring how our economy works. There isn't one simple trick um, to avoid or to, to respond to all of those challenges. It does require a transformation of the economy, which you might be part of later on, but it would be putting the cart before the horse to do it as the first thing or to portray it as a silver bullet, I think. Thanks, Chris. Um, so there's a lot of things in there around ownership and so on that I'm sure Pascal will want to comment on. But before I bring Pascal in, I'm going to go to Claire. Um, so Claire, there's um, obviously been some uh, some criticisms there of um, universal basic income. So what what's the SDLP's position on universal basic income and um, as a means of um, solving some of these issues we've talked about? And do you think uh, that now would be the right time to introduce one? So, so I think really good points about about the context, particularly as as Rosie has has underlined how uh, how much the pandemic has exposed, uh, I suppose, the gaps and the precarity and 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 how uh, close to the economic edge people have have been living. And I think there's just a, a wider understanding of that 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 everybody's life isn't kind of you know neatly in a in a in a in a, you know either one job or in not working and I think as well that kind of buy-in to universality the fact that um you know whether it was furlough or SEISS or or, or whatever or the kind of uh business directed grant schemes they have just gone widely and clearly there have been winners and losers in that there have been people who who maybe didn't have massive uh you know losses to their income or or, or didn't have massively uh or had uh, had reduced uh overheads for example who, who've 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 got a, a large intervention and I think people have 
understood that to make sure nobody uh, fell through the gaps, that's why they 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 have to be widely applied, albeit there were certainly gaps to that. Um, I think it's worth, and, and, and by the way, the SDLP uh, supports it and and was, was uh, in that um, uh, cross-party uh, push on it a number of months ago. I must say, I have always had some scepticism um, about it, primarily just in the context of, of, the, of, of the Conservative government and the worry, yes, the kind of um, distortive effect that, that Chris has referred to in terms of, you know, if it's, if it's kind of, uh, you know, baked in and priced in, that you could see a, a rise in kind of basic costs, but I suppose just in terms of let's say the government that we live under and the worry that it would be, um, you know, it would replace other more targeted and progressive interventions, i.e., you're not getting free school meals anymore, take it out of your basic in income, you know, we're no longer funding this community initiative, sure you've got your thousand pounds, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that it would be used as a way uh, to, to, to withdraw um, other support and that there isn't a, a, a particularly progressive uh, tax system to try and uh, retrieve it um, from, from, from higher earners. I think it's a fair point as well that it, um, uh, you know, it, it covers up um, other gaps and, and and distortion, but I suppose you know you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good here. And, and uh, as well in terms of the economic um, cycle and phasing that we're about to go into, that that concept of helicopter money, basically of of of, of stimulus and cash going directly into people's pockets, um, is 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 of the moment and is 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 relevant. Um, so while there's while there's buy-in, yes, um, sort of I I, I like other. I don't I don't think it's a panacea as I say my my worry is that other other supports and social supports that are more targeted and more progressive um would be wound down um but you know if you can if you can get buy-in and if you can get buy-in from um parts of the economic spectrum who who don't support more targeted and progressive measures then maybe that's the time I think the coalition uh the kind of uh parliament-based coalition uh, that we were part of that we're looking at this we're, we're kind of um i suppose putting in some sub asks whether that was um you know the likes of the universal credit uplift or 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 a uh, uh, an increase in child benefit, for example, that that has a degree of universality. Obviously, it doesn't. It only covers children or 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 or, or people who who live with children. Um. Uh, but finding other ways to do it. So, um. Yes, if it's going, we'll certainly take it. Um. But there there is a risk that it displaces other more targeted um interventions. Uh. And um. And I suppose draws resource away from those. So it wouldn't necessarily um address kind of inequalities and, and the gaps and the, and the challenges that um, that they produce. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to come over to Afroz next. So um, what do you make of those risks that people have identified um, around a potential policy of universal basic income? And do you think now would be the time to implement one? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, I agree with what uh, Rosie said in terms of the fact that it's, uh, you know, if it, if it was in place much sooner, that would have been better, you know, not even necessarily 18 months but ago, but or not necessarily even at the start of the pandemic, even before people were struggling. So, you know, as a result of austerity. So um, I would say the gaps that people have identified um, where people haven't been supported by things like furlough by things like the 20 pound universal credit uplift. Um, I think that pretty much is the strongest argument for universal basic income. Uh, the things that Chris um, mentioned, I would say that is an argument for tackling those issues. So tackling um, you know, nationalization of services or regulation of things like rent and so on. And, um, you know, putting a bit more of a sort of um, a tighter, sort of getting a tighter grasp of that uh, so that people, you know, aren't exploited. So that ordinary people, who, people who do pay rent and so on, um, aren't exploited by uh, sort of, uh, by landlords and, and, you know, by utility companies and so on. Um, so I think that is, so that needs to be done. However, um, I don't think that it can, I don't think that 
the way that people are struggling, that we can afford really to wait until all these things are fixed before we bring in universal credit income. So for, for instance, disabled people um, who are on legacy benefits have not benefited from the 20 pound universal credit uplift. Um, so, you know, so that kind of thing really, who is going to speak up for them then? And where do they sort of, where do they go? How do they, how are we kind of looking out for, um, for, for their well-being. Uh, also, again, people who are feeling pressured, people who are on casual on zero hours contracts and so on. Um, I said a while ago that it's always been sort of a two-tier lockdown in this country in the sense that people who are wealthy enough or who are in jobs that can, that are, you know, who are able to work from home, they can shield themselves from the virus. But the people who, um, don't have a choice, people who do have to go into work, people who are in warehouses and factories and working construction jobs, because for some reason this, this government still thinks of construction as an essential service. Um, you know, all of these people uh, don't have the option of staying home, of working from home, uh, of, you know, sort of, um, uh, again, even with sick pay, they don't have that safety net. So they, even if they are not feeling well, they have to go in, they have to take public transport, uh, which again, increases your exposure to, um, to other people, which is, you know, so all of this to say that we need to think about the people who are being left behind and who haven't been covered by all of the provision that's being made so far economically. Um, uh, you know, all of the people who have fallen through the gaps, uh, through the, you know, with the schemes that have already been put into place. And there are a lot of people who have fallen through those gaps and no one is thinking about them. And we cannot really, they cannot really afford to wait until everything is nationalized, you know? So I think in that sense that that's probably, these people are the strongest argument for why now, if not sort of 18 months ago or whenever is, is, is the right time for a universal basic income to be, to be brought in place. So I'll stop there. Thanks so much. Um, and finally on this one, over to Pascal. Thanks. So I think there's, there's no question that we need to transform out of work payments. Uh, they're some of the lowest in Europe and, um, the NEF highlights that they're 34% they're of a person's average previous in-work income, that this is absolutely shocking. But I think if we're thinking about the, the best use of our energies long-term to achieve a, a universal basic income would obviously require huge amounts of resource of, of the movement. And I, I guess not to be a, um, I, I don't want to reinforce uh, that that classic um, supposed like dichotomy between UBI and UBS. However, I I would agree with what Chris said in terms of uh, we need to demarketize more of our economy. And obviously, <laughs> we own it believes that public services are some of the best things that humans have ever created. They are shared collective goals based on solidarity and they further increase our our power and our rights and and the things we can access as citizens rather than consumers so universal basic income there there is concern that it would you know further enforce that that kind of way of viewing yourself and i think that what what feels like a um really important is is that we keep fighting for those universal basic services that are keeping us um in, in that are keeping us alive so the nhs is under threat at the moment there is a white paper going through that seek that will further privatize the nhs will allow private companies to sit on boards decision making boards um there is a national bus strategy that still doesn't allow uh, public ownership of buses to be legal even um, all of these ways that we continue to allow uh, private companies to basically use our our services and things we need to live a decent and basic life as, as cash cows and I think that this 
it's really vital that we continue to campaign for that. I get uh, one thing I've been thinking about as we've been talking about is how this debate played around out around the um, school free school meals. And of course, um, while we immediately needed to advocate for direct cash and vouchers to go to parents um, so that they could feed their children and not have a third of a carrot given to them by the likes of um, Compass Food Group that have billions in revenue. It's absolutely disgusting. I think longer term, what we want to be talking about are community kitchens, school kitchens, um, locally directly provided services run by the council. This would be a way of, of further boosting our capacity so that we have an active and capable state um, that can channel collective values that we all um, hold and we can achieve economies of scale that way. Um, we can be ensuring kids have healthy food. Uh, we can save work as well. And it's a chance to provide good local unionized jobs. We can expand that service into the community so that we can have more shared community kitchens. All of these things feel like really amazing benefits to improving and expanding public service um, values and public services um, more than I think giving someone 40 quid and asking a parent to yet again go to the shop and, and try to think about all of that um, would be. And we saw um, in, in Wales and Leeds City Council that that can be done really, really well. Council provided services, providing good, healthy, bountiful food. Thank you so much, Pascal. So I'm going to pause there. I can see that Rosie has got her hand up. So I'm going to bring in Rosie and then I'm going to bring in Chris. Uh, if we could keep your answers as pithy as possible, that would be great, just in the interest of time and getting through the rest of our questions. And I'll keep an eye out in case anyone else wants to come in. So over to Rosie first and then I'll bring Chris in. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'll keep this as quick as I can. So the first thing is, I think there's some good evidence that in many cases, um, targeted interventions work less well than just putting cash in people's pockets. Um, and I think it depends very much on what we're talking about. I'm a big believer in public services. I think there are absolutely things that should be provided um, uh, publicly. Um, but I do think that the, in some instances, we need to give people the credit and the opportunity and the respect for, to be able to make those decisions for themselves as to how to spend that money. Um, in terms of the transfer of wealth to private landlords, I think that's a very good point. And I think this is a real problem. I think it's a problem that we currently have with the system that's already in place with housing benefit, actually. Um, I think we see this I mean, uh, in the past when um, low pay is topped up, for example, that can be seen as a subsidy towards uh, employers who are paying low low wages um, that people aren't able to to actually survive on. So I think these are problems that we already have, and we should absolutely address them. I agree with that. I don't think it's a reason for not um, moving to universal basic income. I think uh, I think those are two two things that we and we need to look at both sides of that. Um, and also the other facts we need to we'd absolutely have to reconfigure the tax system in order to do this i think those two things have to go together you can't do universal basic income without a reconfiguring of the tax system um, and universal payouts are something that we already have um, every time the government raises the tax threshold by a thousand pounds that's putting 200 pounds in the pocket of everyone who earns over that threshold so in fact we're giving 200 pounds to everyone who doesn't earn less than that. Um, so when people say that, oh, actually we should be targeting our um, uh, the money that we're giving out to people who really need it, um, I think we need to look at what what happens already. And you know, it, it's less radical than a lot of people think. Um, I think with a, with an appropriate uh, tax system to go alongside it, um, we can do everything that we currently do with benefits plus income tax more easily, more efficiently with a universal system. Thanks, Rosie. Um, so over to you, Chris, to come back on some of those points. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I guess I think it's just worth saying or reiterating that um, the points I guess I was making is that it really is about sequencing. And I think 
I th yeah, I think it's just really important to be clear that the kind of the problem, UBI I don't think will solve the problems it's seeking to solve. You know, if if this comes in under a Tory government, if it's then used to further strip away state capacity and the public sector, because even though people might, you know, in terms of the actual numbers have more money in their pocket, that money kind of becomes worth less. Um, and it's the same um, if we don't take those measures um, to mitigate for inflation, if that's a kind of generalized inflation or a kind of concentrated inflation in specific sectors. Um, again, the UBI doesn't actually do its job because even though there might be the, the number in someone's bank account might be higher, it will just have the same amount going out again. And so I think that's the kind of point I'm making on, on those real basic needs, which is where that tendency is most likely to emerge. It's not really about giving people um, the, the choice of a decision on how they spend their money, because we do have a choice on whether, you know, we spend it um, on, on a flat or on food or on our utilities. Those are all kind of basic needs that we need to spend on. I think that's where there's the strongest risk of that inflation happening um, so as to essentially um, un undermine any of the value that UBI would have and have that go straight into the pockets of private profiteers. Thanks, Chris. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to move us on from this conversation. I know this debate rages on uh, endlessly, um, so we could talk about this one for hours. Um, if you would like to talk about this one, please do tweet along on the hashtag Bright Green Debates and keep the conversation going. Uh, before, before we move on to our next question, um, if you're watching on Facebook, please do share the video uh, and get more people hearing from our great panelists. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, give us a like, give us a share and give us a subscribe. Um, so we've just got about half an hour left, which is an incredibly short window to um, discuss our two final questions. Um, but because they are linked, um, I'm actually going to roll them together and our panelists can answer different aspects of them um, depending on what they want to. Um, so I am going to um, put both the questions to you uh, just so that everyone is clear what we're discussing. Um, so the first aspect of this is we're gonna be discussing what would a truly green Green New Deal look like? Um, and the second uh, is, um, do we need proportional representation in order to deliver climate justice? So our panelists, I'm gonna leave it up to you where you wanna focus your energy on. Um, and um, thank you to our audience who submitted those questions. And on this one, I'm gonna bring in Josiah first. Thanks, yeah, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll take the second question first on proportional representation because um, I, I work with the Electoral Reform Society and this is very close to my heart. Um, but yeah, absolutely, I think, you know, um, on a huge range of, of issues, we are being held back by a voting system which, you know, locks out millions and millions of people every single election. Um, I mean, just taking the Greens themselves, you know, they got 850,000 votes at the 2019 election and one MP. And you take a party like the SNP, who thankfully support proportional rep representation, and you know it's it's a fraction of that, something like thirty thousand votes per per MP. And I think it's not just about the sort of the, the numbers, although you know I think that that does help bring it home. I think really it's about the kind of debate that that we create and the and the kind of politics we have um, by having this voting system, which is so warped and outdated. Um, I, I know I've mentioned the US already, but I think in the, in the presidential election, it was really interesting to see how much of the debate was solely about a handful of sort of Rust Belt states, you know, that held a huge amount of sway under that voting system. And I think that led to Biden and, and parts of the left being really quite hesit hesitant to, to be bold and radical, particularly on issues around fracking. You know, these were fracking states, which held basically all, all the cards when it came to electing the president. And I do think we see a similar thing in the UK. You know, we have debates that are warped by huge areas of the country being effectively ignored as you know, and written off as um, unwinnable. And you have now increasingly the conversations about red wall areas. Um, and I think there's a sort of assumption there that you know the voters there are socially conservative and that that is how our politics should be now because you know we have to we have to solely sort of cater to those voters. Um, so I think that's 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 hugely damaging. I think you know, um, in order to to get climate justice uh, really on the agenda, you know, we do have to talk about political reform and and really push for that. Um, I, on the other hand, though, I think there's a, a strong case to be made that 
we shouldn't support ideas like proportional representation just because we think it's going to give us the political outcome that we want. I think there is something which is you know just right about the principle of fair votes, which is that everyone's voice should count equally, no, no matter what the sort of you know politics, uh, you know, no matter the sort of policies that you think you're going to get out of that. It's just the right thing to do. So I think that's a another point that needs to be made. And um, just very quickly on a green new deal, I think there's probably as many green new deals as there are greens in the world. Um, but I think there are some real points of consensus. You know, we've been talking about green new deal since the financial crash. Um, I think 2030 is obviously a, a really ambitious goal and it's one we need to be definitely um, working towards. Then again, you know, we are, that does mean that in 2024, which is when we'll probably have a chance to kick the Tories out, um, at least six years to really get, get on with this. So I think we have to be really, you know, accept that and be honest with people that they're going to have to be really bold changes that are needed. Um, getting cars off the streets, you know, um, restricting high people who fly all the time. Um, we are going to have to think really big and bold about this. And also in the meantime, think about the grassroots projects that we can be pushing that reduce our carbon emissions, um, you know, that, that create the just transition that we need before, you know, sort of taking over Parliament. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thank you, Josiah. Um, so I'm going to bring uh, Claire in next. So Claire, obviously, um, in the part of the UK that you represent, um, you have proportional uh, representation in your uh, in in some of your elections to um, to storm on onto and in, and also in local elections. Um, so, what do you think the implications of proportional representation have been um, and are for delivering on things like climate justice, um, and then also any reflections you have on what a green new deal should look like? Thanks, thanks, Chris, for for bringing me in because I have a large number of increasingly noisy small children that uh, that are going to derail anything I say un until I go and put them away. But I, I think, I mean, you're right to, to say that uh, Northern Ireland has, has PR for everything except Westminster elections. I know we are not the greatest advert uh, for good electoral outcomes in Northern Ireland, it's fair to say. Um, but at the same time, what what positive things are happening here electorally, um, you know, in, in terms of kind of slow change in, in the assembly do come about as a result of, of PR, STV and, and kind of transfers. And that includes, for example, two new Green Party MLAs in um, in the most recent recent uh, elections, and it does allow people. Yes, a lot of people still kind of vote in 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 older blocks and in kind of a, a an, an older style way, but it allows people who want to kind of explore alternatives um, uh, to to do so. And and for example, in the twenty sixteen uh, assembly election. Um, you know, our party that would traditionally be, uh, you know, and is, uh, you know, an, a nationalist party in terms of aspiring to Irish unity and, and therefore drawing our electoral support from 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 largely one side of the community. There's no no other way of dressing that up, but we're able to, to cooperate more with a moderate unionist party. And that was just a way that because of the system, people, we, we were able to say to people, look, we're not asking you to you know, lobotomize yourself in terms of your longer term constitutional interests, but you can, you can, or your, you know, your, your, your desires, and that does undoubtedly dominate politics here, but you know, that you can kind of reach across and you can just see who would be good uh, governing partners and you could see the kind of green uh, green shoots of that. It's also worth saying that I, I was elected to Westminster for the first time in December, um, coming from what was a four-way marginal and it just it was a toss-up in every election and the only way I mean I, I was elected because I was endorsed and, and campaigned for by the Green Party and others and that was really the only way to ensure the party stayed out of the hands of the very extreme uh, Brexit and extreme other things and um, DUP who, who had held it um, before so people kind of know how to work the system a little bit uh, in in that regard but um, but but the first past the post system is just wholly, wholly unsuited to a society like this. But just generally all of the things that we've discussed tonight in terms of uh, universal basic income, in terms of um, 
you know, really negative outcomes in policing and, and, and Green New Deal. None of them are going to happen if the Tories can continue with the massive chunky majority that they, they currently have. And, and being honest, I just don't see that changing um, in, in terms of, 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 of the numbers of seats that will need to change hands in, in the next one or two Westminster elections. Not least uh, what might happen if, 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 if Scotland is no longer a part of the UK and so on in, in, in terms of what that does to the to the coalition um, uh, at, at Westminster. So I think it's it's absolutely essential, both in terms of the outcomes we want to achieve and just in terms of people feeling represented. Because if you live in, in a safe, safe seat, and I'm sure you'll all hear this from people, you know, your vote like in large parts doesn't matter if you're if your MP has this massive uh, majority forever evermore. I'm not I'm not saying I, I don't want to disenfranchise people. I think it's always worth expressing that view, but really an MP doesn't have to be that responsive if they know that they have a cushion of 20, 25,000 votes and um, that, you know, no matter how terrible they are, um, that that vote is always going to be there. So it's not good for, for democracy and, in, and achieving elected representatives that are that are more reflective of the population and that are palatable um, to a larger number of people in the constituency. And then just look on, on Green New Deal, I suspect that this panel, I would be teaching my granny how to suck eggs if I if I explained what's, what's good in that, but just like we were talking about with UBI, you know the the, the context, the time is now in terms of it, in in terms of time uh, running out to achieve these goals. But in terms of you know the context of historically low borrowing rates, the need for real economic stimulus, the need for intervention and in jobs, um, because of 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 the tightening um that is coming uh, in the economy. So really in terms of striking while the iron's hot it, it, it is now um that jobs layer of it is is very pertinent and that kind of layer of social infrastructure that we need um you know in in terms of everything from kind of you know retrofitting and housing and uh you know sustainable um sustainable transport options and so on just the 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 um sorry phones are in there but uh you know the the, the context is important and um, in terms of how you fund it uh you know again there are opportunities in 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 carbon taxing and windfall tax i i confess i'm being slightly duplicitous i've i've probably in my head taxed amazon and spent it about six times this week alone because you can sort of uh, think of a lot of very useful things that you could uh, that you could you could uh, do with that, but you know there are and and the the Green New Deal APG that uh, I, I'm part of has has submitted you know genuinely comprehensive and sensible uh, options for how you can uh, resource this. And as I say, um, you know borrowing is more of an option than it has ever been before. And then I suppose the last two things are just that transition to a more um, uh, a, a kind of a, a well-being economy, I suppose, is, is, is the language around it, because we know that what gets uh, recorded and what gets counted is what is going to get uh, resourced. And again, again, the last 12 months have really made people think about what is valuable in society in terms of the contribution that people are making um, and, 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 and what is important in terms of uh, how we're all living our lives. So again, I think that... Um, those sorts of ideas are, are pushing more at an open door now than they ever have been. And then again, linking into your question about um, electoral reform, it's about devolution of powers as well, you know, to to to, to the, the most useful level in, 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 in terms of, you know, environmentally responsive decisions. So, I mean, again, for us at the moment, we have... Um, Obviously, Brexit, uh, Northern Ireland Protocol, neither are, are things that Northern Ireland asked for or wished for. But uh, from our party, we are we have been handed lemons with with Brexit, but we are determined to try and make lemonades. And and in terms of you know the protocol keeping us both in the single market and in the UK market, we think it it, it you know offers really big opportunities in terms of advanced manufacturing, and we want to make here uh, you know a green technology hub. But again. You know that would require us to kind of um you ha have a little bit more control over our own destiny in terms of, of powers and that but look uh, you know we could talk about that all, all night but the fundamental point is that uh, unless you get um you know a couple of dozen an idea a couple of hundred more uh progressive bums on on, on seats in westminster not a lot of this isn't going to be um possible i'm gonna duck off and put away those children and hopefully uh come back uh before the end thank you sorry 
Thank you so much, Claire. Um, so I'll bring in Chris next. So there's obviously been some quite passionate support there for moving towards a proportional system. Um, I think Claire there said that the prospect of a Green New Deal was pretty slim without um, abolishing the, the kind of uh, first past the post system in Westminster. Um, so Chris, do you think uh, that proportional representation is um, necessary in order for us to get a Green New Deal? And also, uh, what do you think the kind of role of, de of de democracy and democratic reform should be in any Green New Deal we do deliver? Yeah, thanks, Chris. I mean, I'll, answer, I'll answer that question kind of by answering the, the Green New Deal bit of the question first, and I'll segue very smoothly into it. Um, you know, the initial, you know, the initial question about the Green New Deal was what would a truly green Green New Deal look like? And I've been pondering that for a couple of days. Um, and I think, you know, for me, what I think we need to be really clear on is that the Green New Deal is as much New Deal as it is green. Indeed, the, the real kind of unique point about the Green New Deal is um, there's no there's no point in the green or the green itself isn't achievable without the green without the new deal um, kind of side of it that's it's like unique potency and so what what does this mean what are the things we want um, in order to enable climate justice we need a real um, transformation of the economy of how the economy works um, that means massive investment a total kind of disregarding of austerity logic um, to invest. Uh, in upgrading the economy, a massive program of green jobs to tackle the unemployment crisis at the same time as maximizing our kind of shared resource and economic mobilization um, to decarbonization um, and transition. And really crucially, it means expanding public ownership really as far across the economy as we can go because the private sector, the profit motive of capitalism has abjectly failed um, to decarbonize. And I say it's failed, it hasn't really tried because the profit motive um, structures the economy to the extent that if something isn't going to make a profit, it's not worth doing. And the reality is transitioning the economy, decarbonizing is going to be very, very expensive. Um, and although kind of, you know, um, capitalists like Bill Gates might like to write books about how, in fact, the transition can be profitable. It's just not going to be. Um, so we need to transform the economy in that way so the the key sectors of the economy are under public ownership. So that transition can be accelerated um, so that it can be fair um, and so that it can improve the lives of ordinary people, um, not make them worse, worse, as there is a considerable risk. Um, and really crucially as well, it needs to be internationalist in scope. Um, we need to make sure that we're using our expanded public sector to promote international justice, workers' rights, decarbonisation internationally through supply chains. We need to be cancelling debt internationally to support um, countries, particularly in the global south, um, to do bad decarbonising as well. We need to be welcoming um, climate refugees to this country and supporting other countries where they're perhaps more likely um, to be accepting refugees. And we need to be transferring finance resources and technology internationally as well. Now, I think I'm really, really clear that what we're calling for is an economic transformation on both the scale and the timeline that we probably haven't seen um, in, in history if we're to achieve what we need to achieve. Um, is that going to happen under this Tory government? Of course it isn't. Um, the question then, you know, is that going to happen under this political system, under this democracy? Um, unlikely, it's not looking good. Um, however, I do really think that the question of what is our electoral system should be entirely subordinate to what to the question of what is the most effective way to achieve those aims that I just outlined. Um, I think there's, you know, people, people on this um, debate have already outlined, you know, why proportional, represent proportional representation can be persuasive. And, you know, every time there's a general election that doesn't quite go our way, um, you have these kind of viral memes of, well, this is what Parliament would look like if, um, if we had proportional representation. Um, but there are, there are some concerns or some, you know, some questions, some challenges that I think would need to be mitigated for, and that probably indicate that it's not a silver bullet. Um, I think, you know, we need to be really real that um, as well as, you know, probably increasing representation of progressive forces, of left-wing forces, proportional representation would almost inevitably give rise to, um, would give an electoral foothold to the far right, into fascist forces. And we've seen that, you know, in Europe and in other countries as well, that this is a very real consequence 
um, of having a more proportional system. And you might say, well, that's fair. If people are voting um, for far right parties, they should, they, you know, they should be entitled um, to that position um, in our in our legislature. And I, I, I would challenge that. I would challenge whether a system that um, that gives rise to those very dangerous violent forces and gives gives them legitimacy and power um, is is one that we should be, you know, certainly making a headline demand of our movement. And, you know, I guess, you know, coming back to the question as well, um, would proportional representation help us deliver climate justice? Well, maybe, but maybe not as well. And there are countries that currently have proportional representation and no country right now is doing enough to deliver climate justice. So that leads me to the thought that the real problem isn't what our electoral system is, it's what our economic system is. Um, and so I think for me, we need to prioritize as a movement and we can talk about the kind of constitutional questions of electoral systems. It's not that it's not important, but we need to be prioritizing demands for economic democracy. Because for me, there's no point in democratizing politics if we don't democratize the economy at the same time. Um, and so I think we also need to think about, you know, um, what does this idea of a more consensus-based politics mean for, um, for the challenges of climate justice? I think in some ways, having an electoral system that promotes consensus might actually be a limiting factor on the kind of very decisive, very radical transformations um, that we need. Um, but I'll just finish this point by saying, um, I think rather than treating any individual electoral system as a panacea, we need to focus our energies as a movement for climate justice on building a social majority and building a mass democratic movement for climate justice that can win power regardless of the electoral system that we find ourselves in. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, I will bring Josiah back in in a moment, but I'm going to go to um, Afroz first um, just to respond to these two questions. So firstly, uh, whether we need proportional representation in order to deliver climate justice. And secondly, what would a green, what should a Green New Deal look like? Um, thanks, Chris. I think I probably, you know, I think the question about whether um, we need a proportional representation, it's already been answered. Um, what I would probably want to talk about rather than talking about what, you know, what, what things should look like or be like, um, I would probably want to talk a bit more about what we should be focusing on. So um, Chris talked about the whole kind of economic reform and so on, and pretty much I think any kind of Green New Deal um, or really any kind of um, political reform or any kind of reform in general uh, needs to address um, you know, capitalism and the problem of capitalism. And um, the reason that we are in the situation that we are currently in is because the Tories are in power and pretty much um, you know, they uh, have centered their corporate backers and so on with, um, with everything that they do and corporate corporate interests. And um, so I think what we need to be looking at is how people on the left can mobilize, um, how socialists can mobilize. Uh, and that is kind of, you know, not just within the Labour Party, but just as a movement as a whole. Um, and I think until we effectively do that, um, we there's not going to be any green <laughs> new deal let alone one that's truly green right um because it's not it's not going to happen under the tories um so yeah so it's a question of kind of you know how we effectively mobilize i think a lot of it i'm going to go back to what i said at the start is about um narratives in the media the things that kind of you know so a, a large part of the Tories being in power is the control of the media and the narratives in the media and you know the fact that corporate media works in their service and also state media in terms of the BBC right so and unfortunately the vast majority of people in this country that is what they have access to that is where they get their news so I think it is about kind of um trying as much as possible as a movement, as individuals, you know, anybody who is committed to climate justice, anybody who is committed to, um, you know, to the to the left and socialism, to actually try and perpetuate um, alternative narratives to anyone that they know um, who isn't engaging 
in, in that same way and to make sure that we are politicizing people and that we are radicalizing people um, uh, in, you know, to, to actually see how much they're being screwed over under a, turn, uh, under a Tory government. Um, so that we can sort of, I suppose, loosen the stranglehold that the mainstream media has on the minds of people in this country. Um, you know, so narr that, that, that sort of includes narratives about um, the demonization of immigrants and working class people and so on. And, you know, all of the things that the Tories basically capitalize on to um, come into power and to hold on to power. Um, so, yeah, I don't, um, I think really it's about just kind of addressing the problem of how we tackle those narratives um, so that we can basically look at hopefully, um, like I said, loosening the, the, the influence of the Tories on sort of the general um, public sort of, and kind of, um, yeah, just giving, the, giving those alternative narratives and giving people access to those, um, exposing them to them and politicizing them uh, so that we are broadening, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the and sort of strengthening the, the socialist left movement um, in order to effectively uh, dethrone the Tories, as it were. So, yeah. Thank you so much. And dethroning the Tories is definitely something that we can all get behind. Um, so we have uh, just nine minutes left and we've got two panellists still to bring in and then I will um, come back to you, Josiah. Um, so I'm going to encourage people to speak um, if they can quickly and briefly. Um, I'm going to come over to you, Rosie. So obviously proportional representation, a Green New Deal. You couldn't get two things that are more kind of the cornerstones of the Green Party. So what do you make of this conversation so far? Yes, good questions. Um, I'm going to start with the Green New Deal and then segue into PR. So, um, so often these conversations come down to um, an argument about what colour we want to paint the walls in our fantasy utopia. Um, I think we need to be talking much more about, not about how we'd like it to be when we get there, but how we get there and what our path is to getting there. Um, because ultimately, uh, the a truly green new deal is one that we can actually get to from where we are now um, and that includes you know, being one that we can uh, persuade people to vote for so chris mentioned that we're not going to see that kind of green new deal under the, this tory government i would also argue that we won't see it under any labor government elected by first past the post and we've seen um over the last year or so um how the Labour Party has been chasing public opinion. Um, and that is inevitably a result of the electoral system that we all have to work under. Um, so to bring on to it onto PR, the reason for PR, and I agree 100% with Josiah on this, it's not about the outcomes we want, it's about what that would do to our quality of political debate and the system. So many of our problems as a country come down to our dysfunctional voting system. That, and the problem with that is that then colors everything that happens as a result of it. Um, I mean, for example, in terms of political debate, Solihull's an interesting place because Solihull's like this little alternate universe where the Greens actually benefit from first past the post at a local level. Um, and I see us, I mean, we use all the same um, arguments that we see Labour using nationally, where it says, if you, you know, vote for us to get the Tories out. Um, and I hate doing that. I hate the fact that we make that case, the fact that it becomes a negative campaign about, I mean, obviously we make all the positive points about what we can do as well, but there's always that line of, it's a two horse race. You've got to vote us if you don't want them. Um, and the reason for that is because that's the voting system that we've got. Um, and we have to work with the rules that we've got in order to get to a position where we can implement the rules that we want. So again, in terms of how do we make this happen? Um, 
if we want to have a political system where we have debates over what outcomes people people want rather than what outcomes people don't or vote for us because we're better than the other lot then we need to have a voting system that encourages and allows that and that's we don't have that at the moment um, so this is why i think pr is so important it's not about you know whether this party or that party would get more people it's about the fact that the system is better and better systems generate better results um, so again um for me it's about engaging with reality as it is um, in order to get to reality as we want it to be because if all we do is sit here and talk about how we'd like things to be then we're never going to get there or we're going to end up in with is more of the same more of what we've got um, and again going back to um afronzo made a brilliant point about the mainstream media a lot of this does come down to how do we get those points across? Because at the moment, um, so much of the debate is framed by the way things are presented in the mainstream media. And again, that's another huge problem that we have as a country, I think. Um, we need to address that. And again, that's a much bigger question than we've, we've really got time for tonight. Maybe we can come back and do this again. Um, but I think we have to look at how we do that and what our realistic options are for, for getting to where we want to be. Thank you, Rosie. And on the topic of media, one thing that you can definitely do to improve the media is to uh, support Bright Green and Left Foot Forward and the Canary and other alternative media outlets that we have on this call. Um, so um, finishing off for us before I give Josiah the final word, I'm going to bring in Pascal on this one. Well, I'll try and be really quick. Um, so, so I think that as the last few days have shown us, um, Sisters Uncut actions at the weekend have managed to completely reframe a debate, have managed to get Labour to oppose a bill that they were previously abstaining on, and now we're talking about a bill getting completely uh, taken out of Parliament. I personally think that campaigning and organising and civil disobedience gets the goods, and so while PR is really vital and we do need that, um, I think that it's campaigning uh, that is going to get us a Green New Deal. And I think that public ownership is the only way we're going to get a really green Green New Deal. Um, as Chris said, the, the private sector has shown itself time and time again to be incapable, unwilling of, of moving forward. And again, to kind of highlight a really specific example that we've seen just in the last few days, the bus strategy has has said that they want to, con uh, sorry, the Conservatives' new bus strategy has said that they want to kind of continue with the same old thing, encourage the bus companies to make voluntary improvements in our buses. And that is not the action that we need to see. We need to see a huge investment in our buses. We need to see amazing buses that will make cars um, things that we can put in museums and we don't have much time. So um, I, I don't think we can wait for PR and we need to we need to get organized in our communities and I'll let Josiah speak because I want to hear the beef. Thanks, Pascal, um, for that. Uh, so Josiah, you've been billed as having beef. So I'm giving you the final word on this. I assume you want to come back on some of the points on PR. Um, so the floor is yours in under a minute, if possible, for your beef. Oh, blimey. All right. I'm not sure if it's beef or not. Um, I'm sure me and Chris agree on 99% of things, but I just have to push back on, you know, the idea that, um, that, that we're going to get the change that we need without political reform. I think the British state has hardly changed at all in about 100 years. And I think it's a big part of why our economic system is so messed up is that, you know, on the left, we've been banging our heads against the wall, trying to, you know, thinking that we can win all of our goals and aims within the current Westminster system. And I think, you know, a Scottish journalist Neil Edgerton said it's, it's like trying to milk a vulture. It's, it's just not possible. We have to see political and economic reform as going hand in hand. And I think that's the, that should be at the core of a socialist vision is, is real democracy um, and genuinely empowering people, both in our workplaces. It's both in our workplaces. It's, can't say that word. Workplaces and, you know, in politics as well. And I think that that has to be at the core of everything that we stand for. Thank you, Josiah, and thank you for keeping under a minute. Um, so our time is up. Um, sadly, we're going to have to say goodbye. But for those of you watching on Facebook, it's never too late to give the video a share. Uh, people can watch it back 
and uh, can hear from our excellent panel. Uh, before you disappear and enjoy the rest of your Tuesday evenings um, or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or whenever you're watching on YouTube, uh, I just have a few final bits and pieces to say before you leave. The first of them is to say a massive thank you to everybody who's joined us on Zoom, everybody who's stuck it out on Facebook Live and watched us the whole way through, everybody who's watching it back on YouTube, and of course, an incredibly massive thank you to our phenomenal panel. I found this conversation incredibly enlightening as ever. It's been comradely, there's been disagreements, but it's been friendly disagreements in the interests of working together and having a fruitful discussion. The final things I just wanted to say is um, there will be a series of links now appearing in the chat um, on Zoom. They'll be in the comments on Facebook and in the description of the video on YouTube. Just a final few bits and pieces of plugs and housekeeping. The first of them is just to say that this event is only possible as a result of the kind donations of our generous supporters. If you do feel able to, please do consider making a donation to Bright Green. Um, it helps us to grow and get more people watching these videos, more people reading the articles on our website um, and allowing us to grow and expand. So if you are able to, please donate to Bright Green today. Um, the second thing to say is that we have our next debate um, coming up in just two weeks time, again at 7.30 on March the 30th. We have another phenomenal panel. Uh, we have Rosie Rule from the Young Greens. We have Deborah Hermans from Momentum. We have Olivia Blake, MP from the Labour Party um, and a whole bunch of other great panellists. So do make sure you come to that. There is a link in the chat, in the comments, description, et cetera, um, for where you can register for that call. And as always, you can watch it live on Facebook and watch back on YouTube. And the final thing to say is if you've enjoyed this conversation, you've enjoyed this debate, please do follow us on our social media channels so that you never miss an article, never miss a video and never miss anything that Bright Green does. That's all from me. Thanks once again to our phenomenal panel. It's been an incredible conversation and I hope to see all of you again soon.